Our text today is Psalm 38. If you wouldn't mind uh, opening up in your scriptures to Psalm 38. Um, Psalm 38 is uh, I, one of my, my friends told me, I was, we were just talking and chatting, and he goes, uh, so what are you preaching on? And like, Psalm 38, and he goes, oh, that's, that, that's a sad one. It's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Deep theological um, seminarians will tell you all Psalms can be broken up into two categories, happy ones and sad ones, and this one's on the sad side. But in every, in every sad Psalm, there's always joy, there's always hope. In every sad Psalm, there's always, there's always the Lord. Um, so before we turn uh, our attention to Psalm 38, let us, uh, let us go to the Lord in prayer uh, one more time. Father, we, uh, we thank you. We thank you for being our salvation, Lord. Lord, we thank you for, for being a God who, uh, in our deepest days of despair, Lord, that you can, uh, you can hear us and that you love us and that you, um, you are near to your children, Lord, even when you may seem far off, God. Lord, we thank you uh, for, for, for the joys that we are able to experience when we, when we worship you together, especially as a, as a corporate body, Lord. Lord, I pray for this time uh, in Scripture, Lord. Lord, I pray that you, you would teach us and that you, you would use this text to, to mature us in your mature us and to uh, grow us to become more and more like you. Father, we love you and we praise you. In your son's name, amen. I kind of gave it away earlier. This psalm's a, a sad psalm, but... Wouldn't it be, it'd be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if life were always great? I mean, or at least not bad. Like, wouldn't it be nice if life were always at least okay? Like, we don't need to, like, be celebrating like the Sox won the World Series every single day. But if at least, you know, life weren't, didn't have the bad stuff. If life were at least just neutral all the time, that feels like it would be great. What we know in our lives, there are times when we are, uh, in the middle of depression and anxiety, um, when we feel despair because of what's going around around us, what may or may not happen in the future. And we know um, it's no secret that like depression and anxiety are on the rise in America. Um, Mental Health America claims that 8% of adults, 15% of teenagers suffer from clinical depression every year. That's every year. So like next year, there's a new 8% and a new 15%, and it continues to rotate on and through and through and through. The Anxiety and Depression Association of America claims that 19% of U.S. adults suffer from an anxiety disorder every year. Now, this might not be you specifically this year. Maybe you next year. Maybe it was you last year. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your child. Maybe it's your brother. I, I think I'm coming to the point where this anxiety and depression has affected everyone in this room, either personally or someone who we love. Now, this, this is not meant to turn into a mental health lecture, but, but to establish the fact that anxiety and depression are big, are real indicators of the fallen world that we live in. The world's not supposed to be this way. But we're not meant to be living in this cloud of depression and anxiety. And we can't always fix this problem. Sometimes, like, fixing it um, is always easier said than done. And anxiety and depression can drive a person into a state of hopelessness where the desire to live is gone. And that's, that's not good. And in today's text, we'll see that in deep depression, anxiety, and despair, the Lord offers hope. The Lord offers salvation. Even when we cannot pull ourselves up to, to even just speak words, the Lord hears our groans. The Lord will answer us. The Lord, he himself is our help. This brings us to our main idea that in the darkest days of despair, the Lord is our salvation. Throughout this psalm, David, he is in the darkest days of despair. The Lord has disciplined him for his sin, and this discipline has led to, to physical, to relational, and to emotional, and even to spiritual effects. And the majority of this psalm is, is David describing his darkest days of despair, what, what is happening to him because of his sin. But, but there are four like, like fence post passages or verses throughout this psalm where David looks up from describing his situation and looks and speaks directly to the Lord. 
verses 1, verse 9, verse 15, and then the last two at the end. And these four, these four sections will serve as like fence posts as we try to interpret this psalm. And there's a logical progression where David goes from recognizing the Lord's discipline and his rebuke for his sin to then confessing his sin and then relying upon the Lord for his salvation. And first, we'll see that sin requires heavy rebuke and discipline. The dark days of despair in David's life are the the right consequences for his sinful actions. They're both the natural consequences of his actions and the ones brought by God because of David's sin. Let us turn to this psalm. Let's read these first eight verses. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. For your arrows have sunk into me, and your hand has come down on me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head. Like a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. I am utterly bowed down and prostrate. All the day I go about mourning. For my sides are filled with burning, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. The Lord is rebuking and the Lord is disciplining David for the sin in his life. Verse 1 makes that clear. And David is describing how he is being rebuked. He's describing how he's being disciplined. And in the Psalms, when we read through the Psalms, they're often, uh, almost every single time, the Psalms will have two lines right next to each other. The first one's not indented. The second one is indented. And the indented line is uh, a secondary point or a secondary idea that backs up or illustrates or restates or elaborates or elaborates on the main idea, which is the line above that's not indented. And when uh, we read through this passage of Scripture and we look just at those main ideas, the, the lines that aren't indented, we can get an idea of what's, what's the main idea that, that, is, uh, that the Lord's trying to, um, trying to teach us, trying to tell us. And when we look at verses 3 through 7 again, and we read those main lines, those ones that are not indented, uh, we'll read through them again, and we'll see that every single one of them either talks about directly or alludes to David's physical state. They allude to his body itself. Just look down at verse 3 again. There's no soundness in my flesh. There's no health in my bones, for my iniquities have gone over my head. My wounds stink and fester. I'm utterly bowed down and prostrate. For my sides are filled with burning. And even in verse 8, I'm feeble and crushed. There's something that is being crushed, his body. This man is sick. Physically, he he is sick. And there's something wrong with with his body. Whatever disease he's had, he has, it's making him disgusting. His wounds stink and fester. And twice in these verses, he claims that there is no soundness in his flesh. There's no part of his body that is free from disease. He lacks all strength and vigor. David is physically sick. Possibly the most interesting part of this passage is in verse 2, where David, David says for Your arrows, he's speaking to the Lord, your arrows have sunk into me. Your hand has come down on me. This pain, this sickness has come from God, which raises the question, why would God sink arrows into a man after his own heart? Why would God send his hand down upon his chosen king to lead his people, Israel? It's because sin requires heavy rebuke and discipline. Sin is heinous, and God is holy. God is perfect. He is good. He created the world and all that is in it, and he created it good. And because he created the world, he has the authority to tell the world and to tell you and to tell each one of us uh, how we're supposed to live, what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to worship him, what we are meant for, what our purpose is on earth. And any deviation from this law, any deviation from this created purpose is a sin. And so anytime we disobey God, we're telling our good and our perfect creator, like, nah, I don't need to do that. I want to do this. Like, nah, I don't don't need to follow you here. I'll do this over here. I don't 
really care about what you say is best for me. I'm going to do what everyone around me is doing. We all seem to be working out just fine. And the specific sins that David has committed are very well documented. At the very least, he's an adulterer, a liar, and a murderer. And David admits that his sin is what has led him to this sickness. Look down at verse 3 again, the very end of verse 3. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. Verse 5, my wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. Well, well, all sickness and all illness and all physical diseases in some, some way an effect of the fall. Sometimes sickness can be the direct result of sin. You know, like repeated drunkenness can lead to liver failure. And other decisions can lead to, sinful decisions can lead to our physical body degrading. But sometimes God sends physical sickness as a punishment for sin. We know he, he did this with the Egyptians. One of the plagues in Exodus Right? What were boils on the skin, judgment on the Egyptians for their sin, for enslaving God's people. And to completely rule out the possibility of sin being the cause of a sickness is to cave to an overly Western worldview. Not a bit, when I say overly Western worldview, I mean a worldview that says that all that exists is the natural world, and the only causes and effects that we have are in the natural world, and we can study them through science, and that's it. But a biblical worldview tells us that the spiritual world is real, that God is real, that things like sin, things like God, impact our world and impact us physically. And it can have an effect on our physical lives. And here God has a big effect on David's physical life. David knows it. He never claims that this treatment is unfair. He never claims that God is unjust. He never claims that what's happening is wrong which is why he began the psalm by calling out to the Lord for for mercy. Read verse 1 again. This is the state that he's in, and and so he goes to the Lord at the very beginning. He says, O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. The assumption is, is that the Lord is rebuking him. The assumption is that the Lord is disciplining him. And so he's crying out for mercy, Lord, not in your wrath, not in your anger. And this is exactly the state that David needs to be in. He doesn't have a a soapbox to stand on and say, no, God, you can't treat me this way. Lord God, don't rebuke me. Don't discipline me. This is unjust. No, cries out for mercy. It's not in your anger, not in your wrath. He embodies Hebrews 12, verses 5 and 6, when, when Hebrews tells us, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. And then later in verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 12, he says, for the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So the purpose of this rebuke, the purpose of this discipline is to bring honest confession followed by a corresponding change of life. And as we go throughout the rest of the psalm, we'll see that this discipline does bring about honest confession, at least. That should lead to a corresponding change in his life. In this section, the Lord's discipline is is very heavy and very real, very physical. This discipline has led David to a state of despair where his body is failing him, and he can only groan because of the tumult of his heart. Yet when all he can do is grown, can't even put words together, he still is not hidden from the Lord. Which brings us to the second point in the second passage, second part of this passage. That when sin isolates you, you're not hidden from the Lord. The second section shifts the focus from, from his physical suffering um, to his relational suffering, to the effects that his sin has had on his relationships with his friends and his family. They'll they'll all leave him, and his enemies will come and take advantage of him. Uh, Let's read again. We'll uh, we'll start in verse 8, and we'll read to 14. In verse 8, David claims, I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. O Lord, my longing is before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs, my strength fails me, and the light of my eyes, it also has gone from me. 
My friends and companions stand aloof from my plague, and my nearest kin stand far off. Those who seek my life lay their snares, and those who seek my hurt speak of ruin and meditate treachery all day long. But I am like a deaf man I do not hear, like a mute man who does not open his mouth. I have become like a man who does not hear, and in whose mouth are no rebukes. David's despair is now seen in a different light. While the anguish led him to groaning, led him to non-verbally communicating to the Lord, um, the Lord sees David, and he sees what he is unable to put into words. And especially in days of darkest despair, when words seem in, insufficient or unattainable, we can find comfort in the fact that the Father knows what we need before we ask him. He even knows what we need better than we know what we need. But maybe we need a strong reminder of our frailty and of our sinfulness and our need for a Savior. Maybe we need a strong reminder that the Lord has won salvation for us through Christ. David goes on to mention that his, his heart is throbbing, his strength is failing, the light of his eyes is leaving. It's like J David himself is living out the warning of Jesus from Matthew 6, where he says the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, then your whole body is full of darkness. And if then that light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And this darkness that is felt inside himself. This is, uh, excuse me, that darkness is not just felt inside of himself, but it has caused his relationships with others, th those outside of himself, caused those relationships to radically change. If we remember where we started logically, first, I guess chronologically, first, David sinned. Da David commits his sins, which are well documented. That causes the Lord to discipline him. And the discipline involves serious physical sickness. And that physical sickness leads to his family and his friends to not rush to his aid, but his family and his friends to leave from him. His companions stand aloof from his plague. His nearest kin stand far off. And now it's one thing to be sick. And it's one thing to be alone. But to be sick and alone at the same time, that's something different. Like even when, even when we get like the flu or, or cold, it's nice to have someone to take care of us, to, to bring us medicine, to, to cook our meals for us, to bring us food. David doesn't have any company. Or, or a depressed person may be able to find moments of relief, moments of hope you know, through, through fun activities with friends, through gathering with family for the holidays. But David is abandoned. No one wants to approach him. No one wants to touch him. Christian, instead of running from those who are physically sick, run to them. Care for their need when no one else will. This is a distinguishing feature of Christians. In the parable of the sheep and the goats, in Matthew chapter 25, where Jesus divides the sheep, those who will come into heaven with him, from the goats, those who will be cast off, there are many things that he tells the sheep. Right? He says, "For uh, I, was, um, I didn't have clothes and you clothed me. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me water. One thing he says, I was sick and you visited me. Church, Christians run and help those who are sick. Christians go to those who are sick. That's what the sheep do. Church, let us not be like David's friends who leave because of his plague. David's pain is not over yet. As if physical degradation, as if emotional despair, as if spiritual alienation, as if relational isolation aren't enough, why don't you just throw in a bunch of people who want to kill him, just for good measure? Those who seek my life lay their snares. Those who seek my hurt 
speak of ruin and med meditate treachery all day long. He's isolated and he's alone, yet he has people around him who want to kill him. Yet in the darkest day of despair, the Lord is our salvation. Which is why David shuts himself off from the evil people who seek his hurt. Well, like a deaf man, he does not even listen to them speak their ruin. Like a mute man, he does not rebuke them for their treachery because he waits on the Lord's reply. And he rests on the Lord's answer on his behalf. This ought to remind us of Christ, especially at his arrest. His friends abandoned him. As soon as he was arrested, they all peaced out because being with Jesus wasn't cool anymore. That would have put themselves at risk. Those who sought his life as they were arresting him were currently springing their snares. Those who sought Christ's hurt surely spoke of his, of his ruin and meditated on treachery for days, weeks, years. And yet, like Christ was silent before his accusers, totally trusting the Father, waiting for his answer. And while, we, well, while Christ had no sin, Christ had on him the iniquity of us all. We, like David, we have sin. We are guilty. And like David, when in this psalm, for us today, too, when sin is confessed, the Lord answers. Which brings us to, to point three, what we'll see in the next chunk of the psalm, that when sin is confessed, the Lord answers. David has become like one who is silent and mute, trusting the Lord to answer for him. This is why David asks the Lord to intervene on his behalf for him and before his enemies. The last section shifts towards those enemies, but the effects of his sin are still prevalent. Let's look back down in Scripture. We'll start in verse 13 and roll through to verse 20. But I am like a deaf man I do not hear, like a mute man who does not open his mouth. I have become like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth there are no rebukes. But for you, O Lord, do I wait. It is you, O Lord, my God, who will answer. For I said, O let them not rejoice over me, who boasts against me when my foot slips. For I am ready to fall, and my pain is ever before me. I confess my iniquity. I am sorry for my sin. For my foes are vigorous, they are mighty, and many are those who hate me wrongfully. Those who render me evil for good, Accuse me because I follow after good. Through this psalm, that there's a, there's a decline in how David describes his life individually and a decline in how he describes his relationship with others. Individually, David goes from describing his pains in the first section to now he claims that his pain has reached a point that he's ready to fall or he is prepared to die. This isn't just... I'm ready to, to fall, I'm like, ow, I hurt myself. He is ready to die. And, and relationally, there's no mention of others in the first section. In the second section, really the emphasis is on his family and his friends leaving him. But now in this section, three of the five descriptive verses are all concerned with David's enemies. Like I said a couple seconds ago, his, his pain has brought him to the point that he, he's ready to fall. In verse, verse 16, he asks the Lord, he says, For I said, only let them not rejoice over me, who boast against me when my foot slips. And this prayer and this desire is, is urgent because, verse 17, I am ready to fall. He asks for, for them not to rejoice over me, who boast against me when my foot slips. N immediately thereafter, this prayer is urgent because, for I am ready to fall. He's ready to die. As a description uh, of his personal life and of his relational life, as these descriptions intensify, so does his response to his sin. The purpose of discipline is to, to bring honest confession followed by a corresponding life change. And that's what we see. We see the honest confession in verse 18, where he says, I confess my iniquity. I'm sorry for my sin. And to bring us to a point of confession like, like David is here in verse 18, we have to, first of all, realize that we've disobeyed God. 
we have to realize that our disobedience leads to our death. Sometimes, uh, like with David, uh, we need a strong wake-up call. And realizing that our spiritual mortality, or realizing our spiritual mortality, should bring us to the only one who can give us spiritual life. Jesus died on the cross so the iniquity of us all could be laid upon him, and he rose from the dead to bring life to the dying. And this is the greatest way that the Lord answers his people, is through Christ on the cross and in his resurrection. At the cross, God boldly proclaims, I mean, just look at the, look at the, the effects on the earth as soon as Jesus died. The earth quakes. The curtain was torn. The dead rose from their tombs. The gospel was even proclaimed to the spirits in prison. The Lord answers very loudly on the cross in the darkest day, literally darkness at noon, the darkest day of despair, when the God of life was defeated by death. The Lord proves that he is our salvation. For there's no grave that could ever restrain the God of life. At Jesus' resurrection, he answers even louder. Sin no longer enslaves God's people. We have no need to, to, to sit in our despair without hope, for there is hope, even for the one who's ready to die. Like David, there is hope and salvation. So maybe as you age or as your parents age, and get closer to their death, there is hope. Physical death is not the end. Should you confess your sin and ask for the Lord's mercy, you will have life eternal awaiting you with the Lord himself, because the Lord is our salvation. Or when you are in the darkest days of despair, and you are ready for death to overtake you, you cannot see anything but but a numb, meaningless, pointless fog of darkness. There's hope for you, for the Lord himself is the light at the end of the tunnel. Cry out along with David, verses 21 and 22. David, David ends the psalm. He says, do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. And this final uh, fence post verse, as I've called it earlier, where David goes from describing his situation to speaking to the Lord directly. In this final, these final verses declare that the Lord is our salvation. From verse 1 to verse 22, the Lord disciplines the sinner and reveals himself as our salvation from sin. So, so as we, that's our point four, is that the Lord disciplines the sinner and reveals himself as the salvation from our sin. So as we go back and look at those verses, those fence post verses, let's start in verse 1, where the Lord rebukes and disciplines David for his sin. Right? He says, O oh Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. The Lord's rebuking David for his sin. And then in verse 9, O oh Lord, all my longing is before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. The discipline from the Lord is doing exactly what it is supposed to do. It is drawing the sinner to see God's power and to see God's goodness, which leads David to verse 15. But for you, O Lord, do I wait. It is you, O Lord, my God, who will answer. And here the Lord is trusted. David trusts the Lord to do the work for the sinner, for himself, and to answer him. And then finally, in verse 21 and 22, David calls upon these promises that the Lord has made. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. The Lord has promised his people in Deuteronomy 31, in Joshua 1, the Lord has promised to never leave his people. And here David is relying on God's character, and he's declaring that he is his salvation, that the Lord is David's salvation. Here in these two verses, David calls upon um, God, uh, David calls the Lord by three different names. In all three names, they refer to the same God, but each name refers to different aspects of God's character. First, he invokes Yahweh, 
who is the covenant God, who promises to be faithful to his children despite their sin. It's in verse 21. Oh, do not forsake me, Yahweh, O Lord my God. And then to Elohim, or, or my God, which is more of an, an endearing phrase, more like a father phrase, sort of equivalent to the, the Abba, Father, what we see in the New Testament. And then in verse 21, he cries to Adonai, Lord, my salvation, who is the master of the universe, who is powerful and who is able to save. And as one commentator says, quote, Since Yahweh has promised to be near, the psalmist prays to Yahweh, do not forsake me. Since the child of God needs the presence of his heavenly father, the psalmist prays to Elohim, be not far from me, O my God. And since he submits himself to the sovereignty of God, the psalmist prays to Adonai, come quickly to help me, O Lord, my Savior. Thus, he communicates his cause to the covenant God, to his father, and to the great king. And this is the Lord, the one who keeps his promises, the one who is our father, and the one who is almighty. The Lord, this is who is our salvation. And in the darkest days of despair, the Lord is our salvation. The Lord has always been our salvation. From Genesis, in Genesis 3, when the first sin occur, God immediately rebukes and disciplines Adam and Eve. This rebuke and this discipline in Genesis 3 has led the sinner to an eternity separated from him in a real place called hell. Adam and Eve had to leave the garden because God cannot be where sin is, as Jay said earlier. But the Lord hears the groans. He hears the longing of his creation, the longing of his creation that desires a future salvation, as Romans 8 tells us. The Lord does not sit back idle. Well, the Lord does not stand on his throne and just sit there. Well, stand on his throne and sit there. You know what I mean. The Lord does not sit idle, but at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us, as Romans 5 tells us. And now we call upon the Lord to be our salvation. And that is one thing that this psalm really emphasizes well. It's that the Lord himself is our salvation. This text is not telling us that salvation is something that the Lord gives us. This text is not telling us is that, this is something, that salvation is something that the Lord has won for us. Certainly we can say these things with biblical accuracy, but that's not what this text is saying. This text is telling us that the Lord himself his character, his nature, everything that he is, he is our salvation. He himself is the light at the end of the tunnel. This text should drive us to worship the Lord because salvation is part of the Lord's identity. It is his character. In Matthew 1.21, when they were naming Jesus, when the name of Jesus was given to Mary, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, which literally means Yahweh saves. You shall call his name Yahweh saves, for he will save his people from their sins. This is who our God is. Salvation isn't when the Lord simply frees us from our days of darkest despair. But salvation is when he infiltrates our days of darkest despair, when he brings his presence, and he brings his goodness and his character and all that he is into our lives and he breathes life into our bodies and breathes life into our lives so in your days of darkest despair turn to the lord who is your salvation in church let us let us praise the lord praise the lord who is our salvation